Hi, hello, lovely students. So we already know that there's a connection between structure and function in biology. Um, this video is just a little bit more about the connection um, that exists within proteins. So by the end of this video, we should be able to justify the importance of that 3D structure of proteins in their many, many different functions. So first, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about this image down here. So there's lots of ways to represent the very complicated structures of proteins. Um, this one is done with like a ribbon model. So there's a couple things that I notice when I see this. First, I see some different colors. So those different colors are supposed to represent different aspects of this protein. And if I knew more about what this protein did, I might understand why the artist chose to use those colors. The other thing I notice is that there's all of these little spirals around. Those are all called alpha helices. They're part of the secondary structure of proteins. And we'll see those a little bit more when we look at the structure. So keep this kind of image in the back of your mind as we talk more about proteins. Okay, so the first thing I want to remind you of is just the general structure of proteins. So proteins are made of the monomer amino acids. There are 20 different options for amino acids. There's some things they all have in common, like they have an amino group, they have a hydrogen, they have a carboxyl group, and then they have this R group. The R group is the part that is different for different amino acids. The R groups can be hydrophobic, where they don't like water. They can be hydrophilic, where they like to be with water. They can form disulfide bridges. They can be acids and bases. Even with 20 options, there's a lot of variation within that R group. So the primary structure is going to be just the order of those amino acids and the way that they're put together. So there's going to be a linkage that occurs between each one of those. It's going to be a form of dehydration synthesis. It's going to put those all together. And we are going to also be formed by a group of three DNA nucleotides. Um, DNA codes for proteins, and the way it does that is in groups of three. And so groups of three DNA nucleotides are going to give us every single one of these amino acids. So they're going to come together and be formed into their primary structure. Then after that, depending on the order of those amino acids, the side chains are going to start to chemically interact. And if they chemically interact in a way that they form a spiral, it's called an alpha helix, or if they form this sort of back and forth sheet, it's called a beta pleated sheet. And so that's our secondary structure, and we saw that in the ori original image that we looked at as well. After that, they're going to fold just a little bit more. So this 3D folding of the proteins is all to allow the chemicals to be at their lowest energy state. So all of those R groups, if they're hydrophobic, they want to be away from water. If they're hydrophilic, they want to be near water. If there's an acid and base, they may want to form a salt bridge with each other. If there's two sulfurs, they might want to form a disulfide bridge. Um, so depending on which chemicals allow these things to be at the most stable state, that determines how they're going to fold into their 3D structure. That's called the tertiary structure. That's represented with this image right over here. Then some proteins, not all of them, but some proteins have a quaternary structure. That's going to be where there's multiple groups of proteins that are then put together. So this is an image of hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen within your blood. We notice there's four different colors in this image. That's because each one of those colors represents a whole different polypeptide. They just have to interact with each other before hemoglobin can do its job and carry oxygen. And so if there's multiple polypeptides coming together, that's our quaternary structure. So all of these, the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure, they're all determined by chemistry. And so when you say life is chemistry, it's really because chemistry is allowing these things to fold into the shapes they need to do their job. And proteins have a lot of different jobs. So let's look at just a couple of these. For example, enzymes. Enzyme is a whole group of proteins that allows chemical reactions to happen faster in your body. And in order for enzymes to work, they have to have a really, really specific 3D structure. Let's look at things like brain and nerves. So in order for your brain and nerves to work, there have to be channels within your cell membranes that allow certain things to go in and out of cells. And that is done with very specific proteins. And so all of these different things that we see here, all the things that proteins do, they're all very determinant on the 3D structure. Like hair and nails. For hair and nails, they have to be really, really tight. They have to be strong. They don't have to have the same like shapes as the ones that do other things. And so that 3D structure is really important in all of the different things that proteins do. Because enzymes are so important, I want to spend just a little bit more talking about them. So they're just one type of protein in living organisms, and there's many, many types of proteins. 
They're also very important in their 3D structure, as are all proteins. Enzymes, though, are catalysts. So catalyst is just our general word for any substance which increases the rate of chemical reaction without itself undergoing permanent changes. So it means it can make other stuff happen faster and it can be reused over and over again. So the way that it does that has to do with chemical energy. So this is a uh, free energy diagram where you have our reactants and they're at a certain amount of energy. We have our products and they're at a certain amount of energy. But in order to get any chemical reaction to occur, there is a little hump called the activation energy where extra energy has to be put in before this reaction will continue. And all enzymes do is they reduce the size of that hump. They're able to make it easier for the reaction to start. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it is because it allows these things to happen at a rate that allows for life. Chemical reactions, if life is chemistry, have to happen at a rate that's fast enough for life itself to exist. And enzymes are what does that. So the 3D shape of enzymes is incredibly important in their job. There's part of the 3D shape that's going to be part that actually attaches to the substrate, which is whatever the reactant is trying to go through the reaction. That's called the active site. When the active site attaches to the substrate, it allows it to make the reaction occur faster. The enzyme and the substrate have to match exactly in order for the reaction to occur. So that's illustrated in this image down here, where we see these kind of rounded shapes within the enzyme, and then the substrate fits into those that allows the chemical reaction to occur faster. There's a couple of different models that help explain that. The first one is called the lock and key model, which is represented here with these purple images. So down here, this pink part would represent the enzyme. Notice the really, really specific shape. That would be the specific shape of the active site. It's represented in this with kind of a puzzle piece, but it could be represented in different ways, um, depending on how we're representing our protein. Notice we have these two substrates, the dark purple and the light purple, and they come in and they fit exactly. Once they're in that spot, then they're able to undergo the reaction and they're able to form the product. This is called lock and key model because the enzyme and the substrates fit into each other really exactly, just like a specific key fits into a specific lock. The other model is called the induced fit. It also has to do with a really specific 3D structure. The only difference is that when the substrate comes in, it actually changes the shape of the enzyme itself a little bit. So maybe there's some chemical reactions that occur between those two, then the enzyme might conform a little bit more to the substrate, allowing the products to be formed. Either way, notice our enzyme is unchanged from the beginning to the end, and notice the really important specificity between the substrate and the enzyme. That's going to be important in the way enzymes work. It's also important in the way you can turn enzymes on and off. So if the job of enzymes is to make chemical reactions go faster, we're only going to want certain chemical reactions to go faster at certain times. And one way we could um, make those reactions go faster at certain times is to turn the enzymes either on or off. Inhibition is a way to turn enzymes off. The first way you can turn them off is called competitive inhibition. This is going to be when something that's not the substrate comes in, binds to the active site, and then blocks it. So the substrate itself can't get in. The reaction then can't occur. Competitive inhibition is done by your body on purpose to control the rates of um, reactions. It also is the way that certain drugs and certain poisons can work. The other way that you can either inhibit or even activate, turn on enzymes has to do with allosteric inhibition or allosteric activation. Um, allosteric just means it doesn't happen at the active site itself. It happens somewhere else in the protein, but then through binding in that spot in the protein, it creates a change in the shape of the active site. So allosteric inhibition would be if some other chemical came in and made it so the active site and the substrate cannot bond. Allosteric activation would be if some other chemical came in and made it so the active site and the substrate can bond. Again, this can be done on purpose by your body. It also is the way that drugs and poisons can work. Okay, so the 3D structure of proteins is so important and the 3D structure of enzymes is so important, then if we change that 3D structure, we're changing the ability of that enzyme to work. That's called denaturing. So if you deactivate or turn off a protein by changing its 3D shape, we are denaturing it. 
here's an image representing that, where this would be the active or functional protein with a very specific active site. The denatured protein just has a different 3D structure. There's several different ways to denature proteins, and basing, based on how you do these, it's going to change the activity of the enzyme itself. So one way is temperature. A good example of this is if you ever have fried an egg, there's like that clear jelly on the outside. This is filled with proteins. It has a lot of enzymes in it. When you cook that in a pan, it turns white. That change in color is just a visual representation for the fact that those proteins are denaturing and changing shape. So if we get too hot, then enzymes are going to denature. That is true inside human bodies as well. Also, if it's too cold, enzymes aren't going to work nearly as well either. And the reason why is because molecular collisions have to occur. The enzyme and the substrate have to come together in the right spot before the reaction can happen. And so if everything's moving really slowly, like it does to low temperature, just fewer collisions will occur. The enzyme won't be as efficient. There's going to be an optimal temperature for every enzyme, which is going to be where there's enough molecular motion that it works really well, but not too much that it starts destroying the protein itself. Um, in human bodies, our temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius on the inside, and so most of our enzymes have an optimum temperature as a, at about 37 degrees Celsius. Another thing that can affect enzyme activity is pH. If you have a pH that is too low or too acidic, that can interact with the protein, it can change its 3D shape, can make it so the protein doesn't work. If you have a pH that is too high or too basic, that can also change it. There's going to be an optimum pH for every single enzyme. It's going to be different between different enzymes. So if there's an enzyme in your stomach acid, it's going to work better in an acidic environment. If there's an enzyme in your saliva, it'll work better in a more neutral environment, for example. The last thing that can change the rate of reaction for enzymes is going to be the amount of substrate. So if there's a really low amount of substrate and a lot of enzymes, those enzymes can only work on one substrate at a time, and so the rate of its reaction will go slower. As you add more and more and more substrate, the rate of reaction is going to go faster and faster and faster, but then it's going to reach a point where the more substrate you add, it's not going to matter. And the reason for that is because there's certain enzymes that are there in a specific concentration. In this image, there's three enzymes represented by those light pink little squiggles. Because you only have three, if you add more and more substrate, it's not going to make a difference because each one of those can only act at one time. There's a bunch of stuff having to do with 3D shape of proteins. I hope that is helpful.